Hosanna rock. You alone are shelter from now and forever. So verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. Thank you guys. Thank you. So verily, verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way. A saying is a thief and a robber. <clears throat> but he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Next verse. Right? To him the porter opened and the sheep hear his voice and he calleth his own sheep by name and he leads them out. Verse 4. And when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. And the sheep, what? Follow him. Why? For they know his voice. Alright? Next verse. And a stranger will they not follow, but they will flee from the stranger. For they know not the voice of strangers. Next verse. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. Verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, One, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and he shall go in and out and find what? Pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might what? Have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. But he that's an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf cutteth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he's an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I'm known of mine. As the father knoweth me, even so I the father and I lay down my life for my sheep. Let's stop there. Glory to God. Now, listen. We have been speaking while we wait. While we wait for what? While we wait for the full manifestations of eternal life. You remember? I know I've not preached, I've not taught you in a few weeks, so you might have forgotten. But do, do you remember now? We have been talking while we wait. While we wait for what? While we wait for eternal life. What do we do? Today I said, while we wait, we perfect obedience. Right? Why? Because in this, in this chapter of scripture, let's start from verse 10, then we'll go back to verse 1. Verse 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you may have life, and have it more abundantly. Verse 1, media, 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 media. Verse 1, you will hear Jesus saying in verse 1, he said, very, very, I say unto you, he that entered not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbed in some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Now, please understand this. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That means there has to be a way you are able to trace the thief. And the Bible says that the way you trace the thief is that he does not come in by the door. Then Jesus said to you, I am the door. Right? He said, to me, the porter opened it. And my sheep hear my voice. Now, so follow me. I want to delineate the things that are written there very quickly. So that while we wait, because everything we do while we wait is tending us towards what God has promised us. Which is what? Eternal life. What did verse 10 say? The thief come not but to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and have it. And life there is the way. That's eternal life. That means that the essence of all of the work of the thief 
is to make sure you don't get the way. You don't get eternal life. You don't arrive at that full manifestation of life. That means the, the more we perfect the voice of our shepherd, the closer we are to life. All right? Let's push it a little further. The more we perfect obedience to the voice of our shepherd, the closer we are to life. All right? Because today, if you will hear my voice, harden not your heart. That means that beyond hearing and knowing the voice of the sheep, when the, of the shepherd, when the shepherd sets out, they need to be able to follow him. All right? It then means that the perfection of obedience, listen to this, the perfection of obedience is that whatever the Lord says, I will do. Because if I don't, then I have opened the door to the thief. All right? I'll take you to one other scripture so that you see it in Colossians chapter 2, and then we'll go to Romans chapter 5, and then we'll close. And we'll close on time today because the city is half day. So that I don't go out and then realize that we're the only ones outside. Glory to God. Come on, saints. Glory to God. So, follow me. I'm, I'm trying to make this as simple as possible. That means it's one thing to know the voice of the shepherd. It's another thing for the shepherd to open the door and step out and you follow him. Now, the Bible says that you must also perfect not following a stranger. Because you arrive at the place where you don't know the voice of a stranger. It means that while we wait, we are perfecting the knowledge of his voice. But while we wait, we are also making our hearts open to doing what his voice commands. It then means that a man who is waiting or a man who is in this process of waiting does not have the luxury of mindsets. You don't have it. Because you have a mindset, what happens is that your, your mindset becomes the opening of the window for the thief and the robber. Are you following? It's at this point that I always like to stop and say, Peter said to God, no, Lord. Right? Have you read that story before? On top of the roof of, top of, the, roof of the house of Simon Tanner, Peter said to the Lord, no, Lord, because as Jews, we don't, we don't eat food sacrificed to idols. The God who you believe told you not to eat food sacrificed to idols shows up, sorry, unclean meat. Shows up with a full tray of unclean meat and then he tells you arise and eat. I know God is testing me. Now, it's important that I'm starting from there because you see, many times the moment we speak about obedience, you are thinking in mundane, old-fashioned style obedience. And yet, some of the things that the Spirit of Christ will compel you to do by the voice of the shepherd will look societally unapproved. And I'm not talking about sin. For instance, the Lord will not lead you to sin. Right? Uh -huh. But there are certain things that you have traditionally upheld in your mind that have become a window for a thief and a robber. And every time the thief enters, he steals from you. That's not the only problem. He slows down the process of you arriving at eternal life. That's the real problem. The real problem is that the process of your arrival at life with every disobedience is slowed down. Does it make sense? With every. And tonight, we'll close the service asking God for grace. But look at this. Verse 2, he said, He that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. He said, to him, the porter opened. Verse 3, John 10, 3. To him, the porter opened, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. Please look at this. 
Let me give you a simple advice that should last you the rest of your life. Every time God gives you a porter, don't ever master the voice of the porter above the voice of the shepherd. Sila. Can I say it again? Every time God gives you a porter, don't ever master the voice of the porter above the voice of the shepherd. Why? Because the essence of the porter is to open the door for the shepherd. So if you sit around anybody teaching you God, it has to be clear that he has led you to Christ, not to himself. Are you following me? I did an illustration recently. Pastor Lismos, please do this with me. Come. Look at this. The Bible says in 7 Corinthians 5, look at this. It said, uh, I need one more person. One more person. No. Get me, brother. Come, come, come. Look at this. That God was in Christ Jesus, look at us, reconciling us to himself, and he gave unto us the ministry Who is reconciling us to God? Christ. So what ministry did he give us? So when we reconcile men to God, who reconciled them to God? That means that when we reconcile men to God, we get the opportunity to be Christ. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I wish you heard it. God was in Christ Jesus reconciling us to himself. Then when he saw that we were reconciled, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. It then means that all ministry, listen to this and let it run with you for all of your life. The essence of all ministry is to reveal the person and the glory of Christ. Are you following me? And so the emphasis of all ministry is to teach you how to hear the voice of the shepherd. And the shepherd is not your pastor. Your pastor is a porter. Thank you, sir. Does it make sense? That means if you hang around anybody and your ability to understand the voice of Christ is not improving, something is wrong. Are you following me? I get sick and tired of believers who want to hang around pastors and get answers from them rather than hang around pastors and learn the voice of their shepherd. You complicate our work when you don't improve in hearing the voice of God. But listen, the Bible says to him the porter open it. That means that part of the function of the porter also is to tell you when what you want to open the door for is not your shepherd. I wish you heard me. So, the idea is my sheep, they know my voice. The real question now is, are you able to hear God from any and everyone? And are you able to hear the thief when the voice of the any or everyone changes? Because people have lost their inheritance by an idea. Do you get it? Uh -huh. People have lost an entire inheritance by an idea. The moment the idea enters and settles in you, what happens at that point is that that life, because you see the thief cannot lead you to life. Don't worry, when we get to Colossians chapter 2, you realize that every manifestation of the thief is always do not let any man, any man, any man, any man spoil you. So the manifestation of the thief every time is the idea of men and it sounds philosophically right. And many times the reason why their philosophical idea can get you is because you don't know the voice of the shepherd. Do you get it? I was counseling with somebody not too long ago. You hear this and understand and the person was saying, oh, I have this great opposition. My family against coming to church. And by church, we'll talk about the God Life Assembly. 
And I said, oh, that's not a problem. I said, you won't be the first. All of us came through seasons of not being approved to go to where we were going to. I said, but listen, what you need to be able to look at now is, what is the state of your life now as compared to the state of your life when you came? Are you making progress? If what they say to you plugs you out of here, will you continue making progress? Because you see, the people who are trying to plug you out of a source of life are going to require that life from you tomorrow. And if you become useless to them, they will throw you out. <laughs> Do you get it? So choose which one you want. Whether you want to bear through the persecution now and attain unto the life and be useful to them tomorrow. Or you want to bulk to the pressure of the persecution now. Walk away from life and be useless tomorrow. Listen, and I did not imply by any means that this is the only place where they can find life. I have to ask the person, if they take you out of here, where are they taking you into? They said, no, they want me back where I came out from. So I said, how was your life when you were there? Because if you return back to what you had initially come out from, how do you now translate into finding the life of God suddenly in what could not supply you life before? Are you still here? Come on, saints, are you still here? So, if I cannot return there to find life, I told the, I told the pastor, I said, no, 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 no. I'm not in the business of keeping you. No, no, no. I'm not your shepherd. I'm a porter. Does it make sense? I'm not in the business of keeping you. I'm not your shepherd. I'm a porter. But if I open the door now for you to go out and you meet a wolf outside, I will account to the shepherd of the sheep pen for my opening the door. That means that as a porter, what God expects of me is that I'm standing at the door. That if I open that door, I must be sure it is the shepherd that is waiting for you outside. Uh -huh. That's why all of your life, you must choose your porter carefully. Because let me tell you, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, right? Is that what he said? Unfortunately, the truth is that the younger sheep do not know his voice. The older sheep who know his voice only arrived at knowing his voice by experience. But guess what? The man who is considered worthy of sorrow punishment is a man who has now arrived at knowing the voice but still has consideration in the back of his voice, in, in, of his mind to obey the voice. Uh, because if I know the voice of my shepherd, the moment my shepherd steps out, I follow him. Come on, come on. Do you understand me? Now, so what I'm saying to you now is that while we wait for the manifestation of eternal life, we perfect ourselves in the flexibility of following our shepherd. So, let me say it the way I truly want to say it. While we wait, we are reducing obedience time. We are reducing the time between his speaking and our obeying. Because what should define the amount of time between his speaking and our obeying is how long it takes for us to be sure that he's the one speaking. That means by means of use, we should arrive at such mastery of his voice that makes that when he speaks, we can tell. Because our hearts burned within us while he speaks. And the moment he speaks, we move. Because while we wait, obedience will soon become a survival kit. Sometimes, your life will depend 
unleave this place now. I live with this person. Leave this house now. I am always going out by 8 o'clock. Stop going out by 8 o'clock now. Are you following me? I said, are you following me? Now, so, follow this because there are two other things that the Lord Jesus spoke about. Thank you, Lord. There are two other things that the Lord Jesus spoke about in John chapter 10 I need to call your attention to so that we can transition into what I wanted to show you in Romans chapter 5. So, um, he spoke about the thief, right? Let's finish this whole thief story. He said, everyone who has come in is a thief and a robber. Colossians chapter 2, let's finish that thief story. Then I'll come back and show you the things I wanted you to see tonight. Glory to God. Thank you. Colossians 2.8. But now and forever we cling to our rock. Beware lest any man what? Spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. That means that they can sound convincing, but there has to be a foundation called Christ. Right? So what he said to Israel when he rekindled the hope of bringing them into eternal life is today, if you will hear my voice. What? So today, if you will hear my voice. So the work to delineate and separate his voice from the voice of a thief and a robber now becomes the first work of the man who wants to live in obedience. Because the Bible seems to suggest in Hebrews chapter 5 that obedience is learned. Alright? The Bible says concerning Jesus that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. Now, that means, look at this. Every time God wants to teach you obedience, he steps up the test. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Is that okay? Every time you want to learn obedience, he steps up the test. Let's, let's use normal life so that you are not confused. Every time it's time to enter primary two, you have to write primary one exam. Right? When you write primary one promotional exam and you pass, then you know that you are now in primary two. Now, if you take your primary six question paper and put it beside your primary one question paper, you will know that the exams are not at the same level. Do you understand it? That means that, listen to this, you master the voice of God by progressive response to the things that he has said. And the next set of things he's likely going to say to you are naturally going to be harder than the last set of things that he said to you. All right? In Philippians chapter 2, I'm quickly running through the obedience scriptures because I told you we're not going to close late today. You have um, time to run through. I wish I had the time to settle down and teach it. So this is the kind of teaching that you have to take home and study. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, let this point be you the same, verse 5, the same that was in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not consider equality with God anything to hold tightly unto, but he made himself of no reputation. Can you see it? And took upon himself, what? The form of a servant. These were things that he did, knowing the will of the Father, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, read the next statement, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That means that the cross for Jesus was not an incident, it was an obedience. So the cross did not overwhelm Jesus. They did not arrest Jesus and kill him. Jesus submitted himself to the process of death in response to obedience. Are you following me? That means a true trial 
It's not the trial that befalls you without your permission. Uh, can I say it again? A true trial is not the trial that befalls you without your permission. Have you ever stumbled into an exam? No, they used to set date and time with timetable. You know the class you are entering. That's how trials are. That's how the trials of obedience are like that. The trial of faith can come to you carelessly. But the trial that perfects your obedience is the one that you knew it was coming. God told you what you must do in the circumstance. And when the circumstance came, you did exactly as God said. It's an example in my heart, but I can't share it. It's too early. One day I'll tell you. Shima is the type that a person comes out from cursing you. The Lord tells you, you, you saw him cursing you. And the Lord tells him, he, he tells you he's coming like this to say this. And when he comes, be sure that only a blessing comes out of your mouth. That one. That's when obedience is tested. Obedience is not tested when you're un unconscious. So get so many. Hey, uh, are you understanding me? So get so many. Brings you a full revelation of the cup you need to drink. So you say yes before you drink the cup. Do you get it? If we don't talk like this, you will not understand obedience. You will be thinking convenience. So a man who is sworn to obedience has no room for convenience. So when the Bible was listing the humilities of Jesus, he said, and he became obedient. Can you see he became there? He was not obedient. On, he became. He chose it. Nevertheless, not your will. Let my will. Let, let, not my will. Let your will be done. He chose it. Are you following me? So, while we wait for eternal life, we must exercise our souls in obedience. So a person is standing in front of you and they are lying to you and you know they are lying and God says to you, love believes all things. And you are sitting down there and saying, hmm, yeah. Hmm. It's true. So then you say, on the basis of what you have said, this is what we will do. And you avoid what should have been done. And give a prescription according to the. I need to drink water on this one. When actually what you want to do at that moment is you want to look at the person in the eye and say, Thou fool. Your soul is required of you this night in hell. Make sense? So, learning obedience begins first with even knowing the voice of the shepherd. So, you, there's no discussion of obedience when I'm not sure what the shepherd is saying. So, I'm not talking about I stumbled into a circumstance. God, is he you? Is not you? Eh, it is that me and God agreed that I'm finishing school this year and God told me that I'm not going to get another admission or I will not get a job for the next two years. And in those two years that I'm not getting a job, these are the things he requires for me to do without money in my pocket. And I say, yes, Lord. And live the next two years looking like a destitute on the earth. That's obedience. <laughs> it cannot be obedience without a commandment. Now. Uh -huh. So you don't stumble into obedience. Hosanna to our rock. You alone are shelter. 
come now and hurry. All together? We need to move fast. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now you will notice that the last point before exaltation is the, obedient that, the obedience that leads to death. I give an example I saw in scripture recently. I was reading Revelation 11 again and I was reading the story of the two witnesses. And I realized that the Bible says, and no man could lay hands upon them for as long as the days of their testimonies remain. He said, when the days of their testimonies were ended, then they laid hands upon them. So let me ask you, when the days of their testimony ended, did God take away the power that stopped them from holding them? No, it was that the witness knew that my testimony is ended. So I now must submit myself to death. Go and read the story of all the apostles. That's how they died. They knew where they would die. They knew the city. They went into the city because that's the death that glorified God. We're discussing things that are alien to the church of your day. The reason is because what we are looking for is not what the average person enters church to look for. Somebody is looking for a quick miracle. He's looking for a breakthrough. When we gather here, we are saying, Lord, we came to finish all times. So can you release that life so we live it? Then you have a reason to come back. Let me ask you a question. Do we need breakthrough? Do we need miracles? Is that our emphasis? In fact, let me ask you again. Do we get breakthroughs? Do we get miracles? But has that ever been our emphasis? It then means that as far as the kingdom is concerned, when you emphasize what is more important, the things beneath naturally are added unto you. Do you understand it? So, when you need a breakthrough, the breakthrough comes. You thank the God of the breakthrough, but the breakthrough does not have you. Because what you are looking for is beyond breakthrough. So while we wait in perfect obedience. So taking back to chance number two, beware lest any man spoil you. So I said to you, at the level of argument, it sounds good because it, it sustains philosophy, it sustains the traditions of men, it sustains the rudiments of this world. But if you look closely, Christ is not inside there. What they are asking you to do does not tend to eternal life. Listen to me. Listen to me. Anything that does not tend to life, hold it with a small pinch. Don't hold on to it. Ah, yeah. I read another scripture recently. He said, do not store up for yourself treasure on earth. Where moth can eat Rust can destroy and thieves can break in and steal. So listen to this. That means that God does not create immunity against moth, rust, and thieves. God can use them. So if he sees you holding on to anything very tightly, ah, oh, say, ah, 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 you are adulterers and adulterers. Don't you know that friendship with this thing is enmity against me? Somebody in my house is finding out, out why they stole their phone. Are you, are you following? The moment you create an affinity to it, God can activate mud, rust, or thieves. 
So the moment you arrive at covenant, there's nothing you have that you should hold tightly onto. This is how you hold it. In fact, the security of what you have as far as God is concerned is how you are holding it. Anything that will last in your life, hold it like this. When you hold it like this, what you are saying is God, it belongs to you. Any day you want to collect, you collect. That kind of thing that you, and Kai God, anything you give him, he does not take quick. The one you hold, that's what I'm looking for. Do I have a Christian who can testify? You wish that he took other things. This one, oh God. Who sent you to enter covenant with a jealous God? So if you want to ever create insurance in God, this is how we do insurance in God. Anything he gives us, I'll do like, Lord, when do you need it? Lord, that money, you need it. When you come to church every day, Lord, do, I hope you need it. If you are something like that, God will take it. True. You can even play, use that to play while you to him. Do you see? Lord, that's six million. Do you need it? You actually don't want him to take it. That's why I ask him. Unfortunately, he reads your heart. <laughs> While we wait, we perfect obedience. Are you following me? Something I need to show you in that Colossians chapter 2. Please take me back there. Something I need to show you. So, uh, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after the Christ. Uh, not after Christ, right? For in Christ was the fullness of God, bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. Uh, jump, 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 jump. Ah, yeah. Go to verse 214. 214. Okay, let's just read it. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That means, look at this very carefully. That means that what makes it easy for, what keeps your window open is your body. It's your flesh. Are you following me? Because every philosophy and rudiments of men has to find some place in your flesh that is satisfied. you get it? Uh -huh. there, there has to be some place in your flesh that is satisfied. Fali, do you realize that it is easy for me to get you on my side on a fight if you had a previous problem with Shili? If me and Shili are fighting, it's easy for you to get on my side if you had a previous problem with Shili. What is your problem in it? Is the absence of circumcision. To another side. You understand it? Because you have not arrived at forgiveness. So me and Caleb are fighting Mildred. Right? And Caleb did you something wrong. And I'm fighting with Caleb. It's easy for you to take sides with Caleb. You know why? It's the absence of the circumcision of your heart. Because you are hurt already, anything I say about Caleb is true. So, by the time you are siding me, you side me like you are doing the will of God. So, understand that. I use that only to say to you, every philosophy thrives on the area of the flesh that has not been circumcised. Hey! Thank you, Holy Ghost. Let me add this one. Tight is Old Testament. You see, the reason why you are on Facebook and Twitter agreeing with Daddy Freezer, I'm the only one who is keeping Daddy Freezer alive. Oh, he has, he has died. I mean, he has, he's no longer, he's not the subject. Who is the new person? Is there a new person? I'm not around. Are you following me? The reason why you are online agreeing with Daddy Freezer is not because you want to be accurate with the New Testament. Ay, 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 ay. Are you following me? 
there's an aspect of your flesh that wants to hold back. Because if anybody teaches you that tithe is Old Testament, he should teach you also that in the New Testament, everything you have belongs to God. And he should also teach you that the house to which you belong has the right to place a demand on a portion. As Acts chapter 5. So, what we find in the New Testament is that the church can wake up and decide that because of the adverse need and the adverse persecution that there is in the church, everything that we collect as salary next month is coming to church. That's why Ananias and Sapphira died. Has anybody told you that's the New Testament? Now you see. So, excuse me, which one should we do? Should we do New Testament or Old Testament? And listen to me tonight. Tonight, my argument is not tight or no tight. I'm saying to you that every philosopher that tries over you has to have a portion of your own circumcision. So all the people that are shouting, yes, it's not in the New Testament online. The problem is that they are looking for an uncircumcised space that doesn't want to give to God. I'm glad that those of you who have been around long enough know my stand concerning many of these matters. Is it making sense? It means that one of the ways to trace the thief every time he shows up is check, why do I like this idea? If you learn to judge yourselves, you will not be judged. You will escape God's judgment. Why do I like this idea? If I enter a relationship seminar and somebody asks, how far is too far? And Peter says to you, there is no scripture that says kissing is a sin. In fact, scripture says greet one another. And especially somebody that you want to enter into covenant with. How will you know how strong they are? If then you sat down there and say, yeah, glory. Check what he's saying, glory. It's something that has not been circumcised. Listen, one of the things that I've counseled myself to learn to do and I've exercised myself significantly in is even if I find that it is true, if my response to that truth is because of something that seems like an advantage to me, I will live in the lie. If the reason why I'm rejoicing at the truth is something that is of advantage to me. I'll live in the lie. Ah, yeah. Come, Nachan, come. come. You look like my next example. If I get up next Sunday and I say every sister in this church must have her hair covered because we have discovered from scripture that for you to go to heaven. No part of your hair must show because it's a temptation to angels. <laughs> Look at this. And I say, every sister must come to church like this. Let me ask you. What will be your first response? No, that's not what the Bible says. But let me ask you. Why are you fighting for what the Bible say or did not say? The real problem is the hair you bought, how much you bought it, and how that when you were making it, all that was in your heart was as you are entering to church, nobody will see road. And I've talked to you a number of times. It's how to catch the thief. It's how to catch the thief. 
Because if you don't learn how to catch the thief, you will never learn how to perfect obedience. What will happen is that every time the thief comes, he will rub off on something that excites you. And the moment he rubs off on it, you will get up to defend it, not because you believe it, but because you are protecting a personal advantage. That's the door of the thief. Every time. That's the reason why Judas sold Jesus. Sit down. Is anybody hearing me? Is anybody getting blessed? So while we wait, we perfect obedience. Bed with him, baptism wherein also you are risen with him. Please take note of this. I'm going to show you something concerning it in, in Romans chapter 5. Bed with him in baptism. Okay, thank you, Lord. Bed with him, baptism wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the oppression of God who had raised him from the dead. Next verse, 13. And you being dead in your sins and your own circumcision. Uh, we just finished talking about it. You being dead in your sins and not, uh, do you understand me? So there are two things that are responsible for death. The nature of sin and the uncircumcision of the flesh. Right? Had he quickened. That means the quickening power of the Holy Spirit does not only solve your sins, does not only forgive your sins, it also circumcises your flesh. It means, listen, if you understand the cross, the cross can change your taste buds. Hey. If you understand the cross, the cross can change your desires. If you understand the cross, the cross, it can work there. The problem is that many people who came to the cross for the forgiveness of their sins, they did not come to the cross for the circumcision of their flesh. So you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had he quickened together with Jesus, having forgiven all your trespasses. What, what did the next verse say? I love this verse. Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us that is contrary to us. Listen. That means that there's a, a handwriting on your flesh, on your body that is against the working of the life of God and is contrary to the working of the life of God. You must understand that Jesus did not only forgive your sins. When he went to the cross, he cleaned that handwriting. So if they say, human beings love themselves, it's not me. Human beings love and enjoy sin, it's not me. To enjoy sin is to defile the working on the cross. Because together with dying for my sin, he blotted out. The handwriting of the ordinances that we get. Are you following? So the same way I see sin and I confess. Every time I see an ordinance written in my body that does not agree with the nature of God, I must also confess you too are nailed to the cross. Are you following? Blotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The Bible says, look at this, and having spoiled principalities. Uh -uh, do not let any man spoil you. Because Christ has spoiled principalities. That means the reason why they come to spoil you is they are trying to get back what Christ took from them. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them. How? Openly. Triumphing over them in the show. So it was a show of triumph. There's no demon that is in confusion as to who is in charge. 
every demon knows that Jesus is Lord. That's why Satan is not only in disobedience, he's also a rebellion. See the next statement. Let no man therefore judge you. Uh -uh. First he said, let no man spoil you. Now he's telling you how they spoil you. What happens is that they bring you judgment in meat, in drink, in respect of an holy day, or the new moon, or Sabbath days. Go on, go on, go on. 17, 17. Which are what? A shadow things to come, but the body is what? Do you remember that what they spoiled you with was not after Christ? Aha. So when a man wants to spoil you, what he does is that he does an array of things that look like science, but they don't have a foundation in Christ. Are you following me? And you will see in the next verse that the array of those things can look and sound spiritual. Does not mean they are. Witchcraft is the work of the flesh. Ah. God is saving somebody tonight. Are you following me? So, let no man, can you see let no man again? Go back verse 16. Go back verse 16. 16. Let no man therefore. Verse 18. Let no man. Did you get it? Verse 8. Verse 8, verse 8, verse 8. Colossians 2, 8. Beware, lest that means, if any man takes from you, you permitted him. Because normally when Satan wants to steal from you, what he does is he sends men. Are you following me? Oh, come on. Do you now see why you have to have a proper understanding of the voice of the shepherd? Because in the days that are coming, if eternal life is what we seek, we cannot be confused about the voice of our shepherd. If not, what would happen is, no, go back, go back. The men, back, 16. What men will do is, they will now begin to judge you in meat, in drink, in respect of an holy day, on new moon, or Sabbath days. Wait, stop. You obviously don't understand this, so let me slow down and help you understand it. What they begin to do is they begin to show you standards that are not in Christ that you have not attained unto. Mm -hmm. Now, when they show you standards that are not in Christ that you have not attained unto, what they use that to do is they use that to bring you under control. Because from that point onward, you must do what they say. You'll soon get it. Verse 18. 18, 18, 18, 18, 18. Let's go. Let no man beguile you of your reward in what? Wait, 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 wait. Does that not sound very spiritual? See the next thing. And the what? Does that not sound divine? But when they speak about those things, they are intruding into things that they have never seen. All of those angelic things they try to tell you about is a product of their puffed up fleshly mind. I came to say to you today that the thief is not necessarily a devil waiting somewhere to say to you, ah, drink, smoke this cigar. Because he knows that even basic religion will not let you smoke the cigar. What he will do is he will send something that makes that thing sound spiritual. So that when you are doing it, your conscience is not affected. You do it believing you are serving God. But when you are done serving God, you are being beguiled of an inheritance. That's why I said, while we wait, we perfect obedience. Do you get it? That means not everybody who says to you, I see angels all around. 
confirms that angels are present. Sometimes they are intruding to do things that they have not seen. Listen, you need to understand that spirituality is a tool of control. Listen, and I don't say this so that you will become rebellious. Can I say it again? Because sometimes when you hear things like this in church, you suddenly become suspicious of everybody who is spiritual. Hear me. It is alright to be suspicious. But you must have yardsticks for correction around you. So, Pastor Nismos does not come to you tomorrow and say, eh, I perceive that certain things are out of place in your life. I say, hey, that's, that's the control pastors talk about. It's not looking for control over my life. No, no. Understand that if you despise a porter, it is at the detriment of your life. And yet, you must know when a porter is no longer in consonance with the shepherd. Because the work of the porter is to open the door for the shepherd. I wish there was another English I can use to say it. It then means that you will listen to everyone with a heart that is open. I just showed you how to trace your windows and your doors. Why am I fighting this? If there's a personal benefit I'm protecting, then I know that it is my own circumcision that is fighting it. Why am I agreeing with this? If there's an advantage in it that is making me hold tightly onto it, then I know that I'm also responding by my fleshly mind. But please keep as a valid speaking that spirituality is a tool of control. If a man establishes himself as more spiritual, you must be sure that he is coming after the order of the good shepherd. That the man is able to lay down his life. I wish you heard me. So, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which what he had not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Verse 19, read it. One, two, three, go. Yes. Yeah. And increase at what? That means if the man's reference does not consistently connect you back to Christ, do you get it? Because all nourishment comes from Christ. So let's go on on that matter. That's the reason why it's important that on your pathway to obedience, now I need to lay this out. Um, as simply as possible so that I can begin to round this up. That means on your pathway to obedience, when you are less skilled in hearing, find porters who are like their shepherd, who you know love you enough to lay down their lives for you. And lay down their lives does not mean they go to a cross. Are you following me? While you are with the porter, be mastering the voice of the shepherd. In fact, how you know you have found a good porter is that the good porter insists on and rejoices at your mastery of the voice of the shepherd. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Listen, this message might not only be for your time in the God Life Assembly. I've become conscious now that many of you are going to be scattered abroad on the face of the earth. And I'm also conscious 
that because of those two cameras standing behind, there are people who are hearing us from everywhere in the world. So sometimes the deliverances we are doing is far beyond the room. So understand it. Embrace it and hold it as the law by which you live. So when you are less skilled, what you want to do is you want to trust God to lead you to a porter. Thank God I'm no longer using the word shepherd so that we can separate. All right? To lead you to a porter who is committed to Christ enough to like the shepherd lay down his life. If you find such a porter, listen to the porter because part of what you will find in that porter is his insistence and his rejoicing at your learning the voice of the shepherd. If anybody does not emphasize that you need to know and hear God for yourself in this generation, run away from him. Are you following me? So, let's speak about the two elements I left. One is the good shepherd. The Bible tells us very clearly in John chapter 10 where we're coming from that the good shepherd leads down his life for the sheep, right? And you remember I said it is while we wait for eternal life that we learn obedience, right? Romans chapter 5. Let's go there so that we can start to look for how to close today. Listen. And this is what I'm looking for in Romans chapter 5. So that when you find it, you can rejoice at it. Look at this. The good shepherd will not lay down his life only to save you. He will lay down his life so that you can find life. Are you following me? That's why obedience to the voice of the shepherd becomes important. Because... If the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, what we're discussing there is salvation. So if anything was going to eat the sheep, it came for the shepherd. And the shepherd would rather put himself in harm's way so that the sheep would survive, right? But you will soon find out that obeying the voice of the shepherd is not just about being saved. That in giving his life, what he wanted is so that you can live the life he should have lived. You must four. Four. Let's start from there. Four, 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 four. And patience experience, experience hope. Five. And hope make him not ashamed. Why? Please follow me. Because what? The love of God is shed upon in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Look at this. This is where the story starts. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, what happened? When did he die for us? When we were without strength. When the wolf would have eaten us. And the Bible took the time to explain. He said, for scarcely, for a righteous man will one die. And yet, peradventure, for a good man, somebody will even dare to die. But this is the love of the shepherd. That God commended his love towards us so that while we were yet sinners, I, I don't think many people understand this thing. We were without strength. We were not good. If we were good, small, we can say, ah, okay, maybe because we are kind of good. You understand me? If anything happens to Peter today, I will rise up to the occasion. Do you understand me? If he's in need today, I'll rise up to the occasion. Why? Because in my record are many good things Peter has done for me. Okay, those of you who don't know, Peter is actually my pastor assistant. There are many good places where Peter has covered for me. So when I rise up to do something for Peter, it is not according to the love of the good shepherd. Because somehow, by the good that Peter has done, he deserves it. But you see, Romans chapter 5 first called our attention to the fact that 
when Christ decided to die for us, we were sinners. We didn't mind him. When he was dying, we were part of the contribution. We ran quickly to buy the nail that they were used to. Do you understand? And what made the good shepherd the good shepherd is that in spite of us, he died. Now follow. That's not where I was going to. God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ, what? Eh? Christ did what? Died for us. I'm still in verse 8 now. Christ died for us. Right? While we were sinners. Now verse 9. See the first two words there. Stop. Two. Much more. That means there is a target he has that is higher than dying for you. Aya. 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 That means the moment he says much more automatically means that there is something greater than Christ dying for you as a sinner. That there is something the good shepherd is looking for that is beyond saving you. Much more than being now justified by his blood. That's our salvation. We shall be saved from wrath to him. That means what has happened is that we have been justified. But there is something called saved from wrath. Can we explain it? For if, look at this, we're explaining from the Bible. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by what? Much more. Having been reconciled by the death of the Son, that means what his death did was to reconcile us. But now, what his life is doing is to save us. And that in God's measurement, saving us into eternal life is much more than saving us from our sin. Next verse said, and not only so. But we joy. Don't worry, you will see another much more. Let's go ahead. But we joy also in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now. Now you need to understand the atonement. You understand the atonement? Let me help you understand the blood of the atonement. I spoke about in Exodus 35, I believe, or Exodus 30. Come, sir. Look at this so that you understand the atonement. <laughs> the blood of the atonement was taken by the high priest from a ram or a lamb, one year old, presented before the altar of God. And for every one day, the lamb lived. His blood will speak upon the altar for one day. So the voice of the lamb of the atonement is valid for one year because the lamb is one year old. So every year, another lamb now has to be so that there is another voice of atonement. But Hebrews had an accusation for the voice of that blood. The Bible says that the voice of that blood could not make the commas day unto perfect. He said because in the offering of that blood year after year is a consistent remembrance of sin. So every year the priest was going to offer the blood of the atonement. Israel is reminded we are sinners. Now you will understand why Hebrews said, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer by sprinkling purges the flesh. So as far as God is concerned, if the blood of atonement is here, 
Israel is clean for one year, no matter what they do. Then Hebrew said, how much more? You didn't hear. Which words did we just say? Much more. Look at this. No, go back to verse 30. 30. Put verse 30. Hebrews 9, 30. Put it on the board. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying what? So that God cannot hold sin against Israel as long as the blood of the atonement is there. Read the next verse. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through stop That means this blood that they brought was not a 33 year old blood. It came from the life of eternity past. And because he came from the life of eternity past and presented his blood on this altar. If you can count from here to eternity past for that much longer. make sense to you? That means the problem between you and God is not sin. Because part of what stops you from being perfected is that you are consistently considering yourself a sinner. Unfortunately, our present time, there's no lamb offered every day. But we rim. But we remember the offering of Christ almost as though he, he offered it to remind of us of our sins. He did it so that forever the subject of sin. So between you and God, the discussion is not sin. Listen, so the action of your sin does not affect how God sees you. It affects your perfecting. Are you following me? Because what God was trying to do was purge your conscience. Because Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 keeps telling you that every time you remind yourself of sin, you become a slave to it. I'm showing you the much more of God. So much more we shall be saved through his life. More so, it is by that same process we have received the atonement. That means in being sure that we arrive at life, he established the principle of the atonement by the eternal spirit. So that now that atonement is established, the discussion between you and God is not sin, it's perfection. You are tending more towards life because of the sacrifice of Jesus. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works. See, a fool believes that the atonement grants you license to sin since sin is no longer a subject. But the man who is on the quest to life knows that the reason for the atonement is so that my conscience is purged from dead works. There's no remembrance in my conscience of sin so that I can now serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. understand me. So let me say something to you. You can't wake up every day thinking, let me not sin against God today. It's the guarantee that you will sin. When we wake up every day, we ask, what do I do to serve the living God? What do I do to serve the living God? 
Where do I go to serve the living God? Where will I enter into today to glorify his name? See, I can't enter a place to glorify his name and end up in sin. So the subject of sin, if it ever remains in a man who has gone through this process, it only remains to the degree to which the man is still uncircumcised. Oh, because you don't have to be conscious of sin for the uncircumcision of your flesh to come up against you. Because you can enter a place to do the will of God and then you find your personal advantage. Then your personal advantage draws you to sin. It then means if I purge my conscience from the consciousness of sin and I yield my flesh to the process of circumcision. Now more than ever before, I am closer to the working of eternal life. So I don't need a consistent reminder. Don't smoke, oh, smoking is bad. Don't smoke, smoking is bad. What that does is that by that reminder, the book of Hebrews said, it was, it was, could not make the commas day unto perfect. Because in that working was a constant reminder of sin. In fact, if we had read Romans chapter 5 and gone further, you will find out that the Bible says that God introduced the law so that sin can abound. While we wait, we perfect obedience. And we don't perfect obedience. Our, the obedience we are invited to is not thou shalt not. It's the voice of the shepherd. What is he asking me to do now? So our obedience is not thou shalt not fornicate. Thou shalt not steal. That's not our obedience. The obedience we are perfecting. Do you think that when Jesus and God were discussing Gethsemane, they were discussing thou shalt not steal. I don't know. You are, you are going to have to go to that cross. You need to die for every man. And that is how I will be glorified. So the voice of the shepherd, its primary responsibility is to lead us to where God is glorified. Are you hearing me? The voice of the Holy Spirit will not consistently remind you of sin. I wish you heard me. Doesn't sound spiritual, but it's true. Of course, you know that this does not take away the fact that if you ever arrived at sin, godly sorrow will quickly ignite inside of you. Because you will know, I did not represent God. I, uh, if I came to glorify God, and I did something that does not represent God, my heart will break. In fact, Jesus secured it in what you know as the Lord's Prayer. Sit down, sir. Jesus secured it in what... Jesus secured it in what you know as the Lord pray, Lord's Prayer. I think I've taught this here before, but maybe a long time ago. So, I hope you know that that entire prayer had nothing to do with you. It's kingdom prayer. So, this is what Jesus prayed. Listen to me. Listen to my paraphrase. Our Father in heaven, let your name be exalted and hallowed above all. Let your kingdom be manifest on earth exactly as it is done in heaven. And in manifesting your kingdom, speak to us the portion of instructions that fall to us every day. Forgive us when we are not able to fulfill those instructions perfectly. Just like we are merciful unto those who are not perfect towards us. Do not permit us to enter into the places where we will be distracted from that assignment. Keep us away from the fall. Because the kingdom we came to represent is yours. The power we use is yours. And the glory returns to you. So 
So in the Lord's prayer, he secured the fact that even when we are led of God into what must be done, we require to have been perfected in obedience to fulfill it completely. So to the degree to which we do not fulfill it. So I, I said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He wasn't saying, don't lead us to where sin is so. Because we don't know the voice of a stranger. It's only the voice of a stranger that leads us to where sin is. The voice of the Lord cannot lead us into temptation. What he's saying is, when we go at your voice, what we are not able to perfect, have mercy on our humanity and hurry our perfecting. Because you only do God's will according to the capacity of God that you have embraced. To do God completely is to be perfected completely in God. So while we wait for the day of perfecting, we don't sit down and do nothing. We follow the voice of the shepherd to where the will of God is. And in practicing the will of God, we are being perfected daily. So I have come that they might have life and have it more abundant. while I wait my ears are open to the one who called me saying Lord what, what would you have me do next where would you have me go next who will you have me bless next what will you have me give next speak let my heart obey that's why the prophet said when you approach the altar of God don't, be, don't offer the sacrifices of fools. That means, don't, listen, you don't determine the offering of God. You give him what he asked. So he said, when you approach the altar of God, draw near to listen rather than offer the sacrifices of fools. Don't just suppose that anything you brought to God, he has taken. Unfortunately, the culture of the offering we have been taught makes us offer like that consistently. It got so bad that anytime they say it's offering time, you know, it's that is then you are thinking, what should I give? Where that change? Now I'm using offering because it makes sense to you. Because the offerings of God are not just when we put money in the basket. That means that the moment they, said it's, they, they say it's time for offering, the first thing you should have done, Lord, what do you have me give? Let me tell you, if it's God, one day you hear him say, I'm not looking for your money. Give me your attention. See, I've been watching too many movies lately. I've been looking for your attention. So, Lord, that's what you want me to offer. From today, no movie. until such a time that I sense that you have released me again. And that day, if the offering basket is passing your front, confidently don't give. I don't know how many pastors teach like this. You know what I mean by confidently don't give? Do you know that you feel embarrassed when the offering basket is passing and you're not putting something? So at some point when we were children, we even became stupid. Just do like this. Put her inside. Remove it empty. Be because let's say, is, is it only us that now came to church? Unfortunately, nobody noticed whether you gave offering or not. Many times, not even the person who is sitting next to you. From now and forever, we cling to our rock. Hosanna, our rock. You alone are shelter, both now and forever. We run to our rock, Hosanna oh, rock. You alone are shelter from now and forever.
from dead works so that I can serve the living God. The emphasis for the man who seeks perfection is the service of the living God. So that the flesh of the Lord prospers in my hands. I run to my rock. Hosanna my rock. You alone are my shelter and it's both now and forever. You alone are my shelter both now and forever. That I wake up daily seeking where I will do your way. I wake up daily with my ears open to hear what you will have me do today. Give me this day my daily portion of instructions. I am your sheep. I know your voice. Read me from the voice of strangers. Let no thief, no robber, Register their voice in me to the degree that they compel obedience out of me because of the uncircumcision of my flesh. Let no thief, no robber can devour us. I love you, my rock. Hosanna, my rock. You alone are my shelter. Oh, now and forever. I run to my rock. Oh, Sana, my rock. You alone are my shelter. And it's both now and forever. I embrace you, my rock. Hosanna to my rock. You alone are my shelter. And it's from now and forever. Find his voice. Say to him, take me to the cleft of the rock. Let me hear your voice. Let me know you. Somebody needs to say, Lord, thank you for potters. While they watch over me, let me perfect the knowledge of your voice. Love you, my rock. Hosanna, my rock. You alone are my shelter. And it's both now and forever. Kondi barata suvele dia basom de geste pelataya e kapa dovre hila radi basovre geste palianda bakaila that every working of the flesh that clogs my hearing while I wait. Every tradition of men, many times where the thief gets us, is that we are locked in traditions. 
And so every time anything is set in front of us, we already know the tradition for its fulfillment. And we fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of the standard of obedience. Tonight we embrace you, our rock. Hosanna to our rock. You alone are shelter from now and forever. We walk before you, our rock. Hosanna, our rock. He said to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. You alone are shelter. And it's from now and forever. We walk before you, our rock. Hosanna, our rock. You alone are shelter. Oh, and it's both now and forever. Oh, I believe you, my rock. Oh, Santa, my rock. You alone are my shelter. From now and forever. I believe you, my rock. The Bible says, and Abraham believed God and was accounted unto him for righteousness. He had no seed when God stood him by the stars. I said to him, count the stars as many as they are. That's the number of your children. The Bible says, and Abraham believed God. Will you dare believe God today? That a stirring of divine rivers can come out of you and bless the nations of the earth. That he has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But that what is necessary is that you perfect the hearing of the voice of the shepherd. You alone are my shelter from now and forever. I wait upon you, my rock. Hosanna, my rock. You alone are my shelter. From now and forever. I follow my rock. Hosanna, my rock. You alone are my shelter from now and forever. I follow my rock. Hosanna to my rock. You alone are my shelter from now and forever. I believe you, my rock. Hosanna, my rock. You alone are my shelter. And it's both now and forever. Father, today I declare the opening of years. I declare the yieldedness of our hearts. You are our God. We are the people of your pasture. We are the sheep of your hand. Today we hear your voice. And we harden not our hearts. While we wait for the fullness of life. We yield to you in obedience. We choose obedience. Blessed be your name. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Glory to God.